Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Hey, we're glad you're with us for this Friday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. We can tell you right off the top, it's not going to be a super cheery one. We've got three major stories today that we're going to talk about. None of them particularly good. Jim, I don't know that we've ever officially recommended anyone actually get a martini or some other drink before they listen to the podcast. But if you're ever going to do it, today might might be the day. Uh, some pretty heavy issues today, but we're going we're gonna to tackle them because they need to be tackled. Let's start with the situation in Afghanistan. We've talked about this numerous times in recent weeks, that it looked like the Taliban was uh, on the march, uh, that uh, this Afghan government might not hold, the U.S. trained Afghan military might not hold. But Jim... Just five weeks ago, July 8th, to be precise, Joe Biden was at the White House announcing that the uh, the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan would be uh, done not only by September 11th, but by the end of this month, the end of August. And he took a number of questions at the end of that statement. And, well, let's just say the last five weeks have not been kind in backing up Joe Biden's predictions about what would happen. Question and answer number one. Is the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan now inevitable? No, it is not. Because you have the Afghan troops have 300,000 well-equipped, as well-equipped as any army in the world, and an air force against something like 75,000 Taliban. It is not inevitable. Yeah, well, uh, it's certainly looking inevitable right now. Another question from that same press conference. Some Vietnamese veterans see echoes of their experience in this withdrawal in Afghanistan. Do you see any parallels between this withdrawal and what happened in Vietnam with some people feeling? None whatsoever. Zero. What you had is you had entire brigades breaking through the gates of our embassy. Six, if I'm not mistaken. The Taliban is not the the North Vietnamese army. They're not, they're not remotely comparable in terms of capability. There's going to be no circumstance where you see people being lifted off the roof of an embassy in the, of the United States from Afghanistan. It is not at all comparable. Well, that is yet to be seen if we'll see that same image, but we're already sending thousands of troops back in to make sure they get evacuated. There's lots of Afghan allies who help the United States that the Taliban are ready to kill. They're already doing it in all these other cities. Most of the other major cities, Kandahar, Herat, uh, other places have already fallen, district after district. Most of the time, the Afghan military not even fighting. They're just putting down their weapons and either surrendering or running away. And so the Taliban is getting closer and closer to Kabul. Uh, People there just assume they're going to get slaughtered at this point. So, Jim, we got a tweet yesterday from the U.S. Embassy in Afghanistan pretty much begging the Taliban not to attack their facility. And if that wasn't enough, Tom Bowman over at NPR says the situation at the U.S. Embassy in Kabul is more dire than what the State Department is saying. Mail has stopped. Nearly all employees are packing up and a very small number will head to another location. Staff are gearing up to destroy sensitive papers, computers and phones. So I don't know what type of orderly evacuation was expected here, Jim, but clearly this is uh, out of control now and the Taliban's going to be in charge. It's just a matter of when. Listeners might be wondering, Jim and Greg talked about Afghanistan earlier in the week. Why are they talking about it again? Well, just in the span of a couple of days, the situation has changed and gotten worse yet again. Uh, on Friday, they took four more provincial capitals, and they've already now have control of the country's second and third largest cities, Herat in the west and Kandahar in the south. Um, the momentum is shifting very, very quickly. The uh, Taliban now controls more than half of the provincial capitals. They control more than two thirds of the territory. Uh, Everybody can see what's going on here. And that makes every one of those Biden assurances just utterly insufferable. And they suggest a man who was walking around in utter denial of what was the most likely consequences of this. Or ultimately, he did have some sense of this and he basically was comfortable lying to the American public. I just kind of pointed this out in the corner and I'm like, look, how much of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan was effectively sold on this account of, no, no, we're going to withdraw and things are going to be fine. The Afghan army can handle it. It's time for them to take over. It's not going to be a disaster. Uh, Biden explicitly said this is not like Vietnam. They are not the Taliban is not the North Vietnamese army. Um, there's a, that ludicrous assumption, the d- statement, quote, 
the likelihood that there's going to be the Taliban overrunning everything and owning the whole country is highly unlikely. Guess what, Mr. President? That scenario you just assured Americans was highly unlikely is happening right in front of our eyes. And I kind of am left wondering if Obama, if, if uh, I keep calling this book between this and the editors, I keep calling <laughs> Biden Obama, which I think, by the way, is this like, you know, it's a Freudian slip, but I think it also reveals the return of policies that did not work. This is the ISIS and, and Iraq playbook all over again. Yep. Biden could have gone out and said, like, if he was really honest, and I, just, I, I have a very hard time believing the entire U.S. Uh, intelligence and military community is this stunned, had no idea that the uh, Afghan army would collapse this quickly. Um, if he'd gone out and said, we're going to leave Afghanistan, the Taliban is almost certain to take over. It's going to be an absolute humanitarian disaster. You're going to have huge waves of refugees going in every possible direction. And oh, by the way, Islamist fundamentalism is going to see this as their biggest victory since the formulation of the Islamic State. If Biden had gone around the country saying that, would people have been as supportive of Afghanistan withdrawal? I'm not so sure. I, I think it's a really fair question to ask that one of the things that made withdrawal look like such a long overdue decision was the sense that, well, okay, we can do this and this isn't going to hurt us in the long run. We're going to be fine. The problems in Afghanistan will stay contained to Afghanistan. And this is, you know, it's time for us to get out and move on to focusing our own problems. Well, the problem with Afghanistan, you know, everyone's like, why do, I, why do all these empires keep coming into Afghanistan? Well, the part of the problem is that Afghanistan exports its problems. Nobody in the United States wanted to take over Afghanistan. Up until September 11th, nobody wanted to do it. But once you know, after you know, once the 9/11 attacks occurred, it became a necessity. We could not keep the Taliban in charge. They had protected the guys who attacked us. And what do you think they're going to do when they're back in charge again? So, um, extraordinarily frustrating. Ob Biden is not ask answering any questions on this. It's understandable why, but this is his decision. He owns it, and he's going to be the guy uh, who at least immediately has to deal with a restored Taliban. And every one of these lines indicate, every other report we get indicates that there's, the policy is guided by this insanely blind belief that the Taliban can be reasonable if we just ask them the right way. Um, probably this the statement that is most likely to make me scream at uh, people and, and you know say something on this podcast that I shouldn't is a line in Axios today, quote, at the same time, Biden's diplomatic team in Doha, Qatar was trying to talk sense to the Taliban. Greg, how likely is it we're going to, quote, talk sense into the Taliban? The Taliban? Pretty low. Pretty low. <laughs> and look, I mean, it's insane. But uh, I remember both of us being pretty upset that uh, Trump was pretty close to bringing the Taliban to Camp David because he thought he could strike a deal with them. So it's not uh, just the Biden administration who thought that the Taliban was going to behave. I guess the Taliban has said at these uh, different negotiations, sure, sure, you leave. Uh, you know, we're going to want some uh, some skin in the game here, but we want some uh, international legitimacy. We're going to want some aid and some uh, some money coming our way. Well, yeah, we'll be better international citizens. And we actually believed that um, yeah. across the board, apparently. And just it's just amazing. I mean, when people have shown you who they are, you better believe we, we've been played by suckers. We 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 are and were a bunch of suckers. Amazing. Amazing. And. It, my heart just breaks for all the service members who, uh, you know, they lost their buddies. Uh, they're dealing with injuries of their own. They, the families, uh, just seeing this all dissolve uh, and so so quickly. It's, ugh, it, it's never easy in Afghanistan. I don't know what the right policy is, but clearly this one has been a catastrophic failure. All right. Hard to transition from that to uh, one of the great mouthwashes of the world, but uh, we're very happy to have Quip as our sponsor today because, look, uh, you basically have the triple crown of oral care, right? You've got a brush, you got a floss, and you also need a quality mouthwash that's going to get rid of that bacteria that causes the plaque and the gingivitis and the tartar as well. And so Quip, in addition to having the fantastic electric toothbrushes, the refillable floss, now has the mouthwash. Quip mouthwash kills bad breath germs, helps prevent cavities, and leaves you feeling fresh thanks to a formula that gives your mouth everything it needs and nothing it doesn't need. Their four times concentrate has fluoride, xylitol, and CPC, but they left out the artificial colors and stinging alcohol that you'll find in a lot of other brands. The refillable dispenser's compact footprint will fit in any bathroom, big or small, and with five colors and two high-end finishes to choose from, you're guaranteed to find a dispenser that matches your style. This is the one mouthwash you definitely won't want to hide under the sink. 
sitting on your counter, it's a beautiful reminder to rinse every day and a subtle way of letting everyone know that your oral care game is next level. We've got the toothbrushes at our house. Uh, we've also got the mouthwash now. And Jim is exactly right. It does the job, and it doesn't have that overwhelming intensity that a lot of those other mouthwashes have. So it's uh, great, especially uh, if your kids don't like that intense feel as well. And so uh, pair up the mouthwash with a Quip Electric toothbrush and or the refillable flossers, and you will have your whole oral routine ready to go. And if you go to getquip.com slash martini5, that's martini and the number five, right now you can get $5 off the mouthwash starter kit. That's $5 off a mouthwash starter kit, which includes a refillable dispenser and a 90-dose supply of Quip's four times concentrated formula at getquip.com slash martini5. Spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash martini5. Remember, Quip is the good habits company. All right, Jim, our next bad martini, we got a lot of them today, uh, comes to us Courtesy of the U.S. Customs and Border Protection Enforcement data released on Thursday. Speaking of Joe Biden's statements that uh, have been proven absurdly wrong in short order, remember back at his press conference in March, he said, oh, yeah, it's a seasonal thing on the border. We got This happens every year at this time when it gets too hot. They're not going to keep coming. Well, they keep coming. And it's the hottest time of the year. And the July numbers are higher than any other month. In fact, they're the highest numbers in 21 years. 212,672 migrants were taken into U.S. custody in July. 82,000, almost 83,000 of those were family members. Almost 19,000 of those were unaccompanied teenagers and children. Think about that. And the rest meaning uh, over 100,000 were single adults. Uh, Unaccompanied minors crossing the border increased 24% from June to July. And Jim, we're hearing from other sources that uh, of the migrants they bother to test for COVID, about 30 to 40% are testing positive. And whether they test positive or not, they're busing and flying them all over Texas and in some cases uh, to several other states as well. So uh, this mess is getting worse And once again, just like the previous story, the Biden administration has no coherent plan. No. And, you know, again, this there's a common theme to a lot of our gripes with the Biden administration. You point out a terrible problem with them or a problem to them and they will say, oh, it's not a problem. And you'll point to it getting worse and they'll insist, oh, no, it's not a problem. Usually the common line is, you know, it was a seasonal pattern. And while there was a little bit of truth to that. And that, you know, that, yes, it generally was bigger in winter months when the weather wasn't so bad and got, you know, went down in the summer months when the weather was so hot that people uh, didn't want to make the journey. Um, There was, you know, there was also this they could complain, okay, well, you know, 2020 was really low because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Fewer people were coming over. So, yeah, of course, you're going to have a huge year over year jump. But month by month, it became clear this was not some temporary one. And also like this, even if you want to talk about seasonal patterns, this was way higher than the normal seasonal pattern. And as you mentioned, here's July, one of the hottest months of the year, and it's actually the highest ever. This is, you know, now we are well beyond anything resembling um, a seasonal pattern or something justifiable or something like that. Clearly, this is a response to the administration's rhetoric. People all across Central America are looking at this and saying, you know what, America has an open door. And that clearly Kamala Harris hasn't done an arm bit of good. Clearly, all of this long-term planning and we're addressing root causes is not doing a darn bit of good. The only thing you can do is strengthen border security. And this is what the administration doesn't want to do. They didn't even want to finish the uh, fencing projects that were half completed. It is absolutely ridiculous, infuriating. Um, You know, I I guess the question is like, how many times does the Biden administration have to be proved wrong for them to be forced into changing their approach? And as of now, you know, four straight months of you've got to be kidding me kind of numbers has not been enough. No, absolutely right. And uh, according to other data that I saw yesterday, even though the overall number of illegals coming in uh, was up uh, from in July compared to June, the number of deportations actually went down. So it's just a fraction of the people actually uh, getting sent back. And Jim, oftentimes we talk about numbers being off the charts. I don't know if you saw this yesterday, but CPB, when they first put out the the, the data, it was literally off the charts because they capped it at 200,000. They had to go back and uh, fix their format. uh, So it looked like there was actually room to increase, which it very well might uh, in August as of this. But uh, when you have to actually change the parameters of your chart, uh, chances are it's not routine. So I think I want you to see, keep it like the regular box and just have it go up above it. 
And then like a little bit below, you should have like revised figure and then like make it very clear that like you took another piece of paper <laughs> and had to draw it up <laughs> higher to illustrate just how high it is. Um, you know, otherwise it's just like, oh no, we always expected more than 200,000. That's real. more than 200,000 in a month is really a lot of migrants, folks. And uh, as usual, this is measuring who they encounter. Obviously, they can't measure who they don't encounter. Exactly. The ones that didn't get apprehended, absolutely, uh, should be added to the total. But since we have no idea what that number is, we can't. But uh, again, Mayorkas, Biden, Harris, who's really, as far as we can tell, doing very little on that. Root causes, apparently, but uh, not not effectively dealing with those. Uh, Jim, let's uh, talk about something that will hopefully make us feel a little bit better, and that is the feel of a luxurious towel when you step out of the shower. Wrap yourself in nothing but the best with the My Pillow towel set. We've talked about the pillows and the sheets and the slippers. The towel set, fantastic as well. Gets you dry super quick, as I've said many times. It also just feels great. And uh, once again, the six-piece towel set on sale by a lot. Their current offer is that you can get the six-piece towel set, which regularly goes for $109.99, for just $39.99. Now each set is two bath towels, two hand towels, and a washcloth two pack. They're made from proprietary technology that makes them highly absorbent. They're soft to the touch without that lotiony feel. They're made from cotton grown right here in the United States. These towels are available in a variety of colors and sizes. They're machine washable, and they come with a 60 day money back guarantee and a one year limited warranty. So visit MyPillow.com, click on the Radio Listener's Special button, make sure you do that first, and use the promo code MARTINI at checkout or call 800-874-0104. The MyPillow six-piece towel set for only $39.99. Now while you're there, take advantage of the deep discounts on all the other MyPillow products, including the Giza Dream bed sheets and the MyPillow premium pillows. MyPillow.com or call 800-874-0104. All right, Jim, this is, I think, also a bad martini, but there's certainly some crazy elements to it. But uh, Associated Press with this story about the Biden administration eyeing tougher vaccine rules uh, without provoking backlash is how the uh, title goes. And so over time, the Biden administration has been slowly working up to the idea of vaccine mandates. And uh, this paragraph ought to chill just about anyone. White House officials say Biden wanted to initially operate with restraint to ensure that Americans were ready for the strong arming from the federal government. The federal moves have been carefully calibrated to encourage a wave of businesses and governments to follow suit. Now, he's considered certain things that he hasn't actually acted on, other things he has, like the uh, federal employee vaccine mandate, as well as the federal contractor mandate. At one time, he was looking at uh, mandating that all airline passengers be vaccinated. And uh, here's a couple more. Still, while more severe measures, such as mandating vaccines for interstate travel or changing how the federal government reimburses treatment for those who are unvaccinated and become ill with COVID-19 have been discussed. Later on, it says the uh, interstate travel vaccination requirement is not currently under consideration. Jim, the fact that in our society that was ever even remotely considered uh, is uh, is terrifying. Can you imagine basically having to present papers at the border? I mean, this is not... Um, you got to distinguish between should you get vaccinated versus should the government be doing this to you if you're not vaccinated? And this is getting completely absurd. Greg, back on July 30th, I, I just like, in case you're wondering, like, you know, my attitude is international travel. Absolutely. Obviously, there's lots of precedents for people needing uh, vaccination records to visit certain countries. Cruise ships makes absolute sense to me. Lots of people crammed in close, spending overnight. Uh, dining together, uh, touching the same, you know, doorknobs. And, and so, you know, we saw the, how quickly COVID spread on cruise ships early in this. But requiring, you know, proof of vaccination for interstate travel? No, no, I got all kinds of rude responses to that. And I'd said, I want the current vaccine passport cheerleaders to take a moment to envision the Acela halted on the tracks before Trenton as New Jersey state troopers. <laughs> <clears throat> By the way, look closely at the uh, uh, uniform design for New Jersey state troopers and see if it reminds you of anything. Turns out, actually, yes, they did use the same one, the same uh, uniform designer as the Germans. Uh, New Jersey state troopers move through the train, currently requesting papers, please. Please show me your papers with your proof of vaccination. And I say this as somebody who has said that if I were any more pro-vaccination, I'd be running down the street stabbing people. 
with needles to get this into them. I really want you to go out and get vaccinated. But I do not want the U.S. government instituting any type of regime where you have to show proof of vaccination to go from one place to another. Absolutely unconstitutional, completely against every American tradition. So a whole bunch of people said, Jim, it's just like ticket takers. Jim, you must be, you know, all kinds of stuff. But the other thing was, Jim, don't be ridiculous. Nobody's talking about requiring proof of vaccination for interstate travel. Well, lo and behold, in fact, the Biden administration was indeed discussing this. Now, we shouldn't overstate it. It is discussions. It is not, um, uh, you know, the, the, we, we haven't heard any legislation. We haven't seen any definite implementation of this particular idea. But I do think this is something that, uh, you know, we should be smacked down at the first opportunity. And, uh, oh, by the way, I think we kind of also have to recognize kind of the absurdity of this. Um, like, first of all, thinking not just of like, you know, uh, the state line between New York and New Jersey, uh, state lines between Virginia, D Washington, D.C., and Maryland. You know, this is ridiculous. How on God's green earth would you ever enforce it? Hey, Teamsters, how do you feel about having your, your vaccine status checked each time you go across the state? But then like, my favorite example came from a guy on Twitter. who goes about identity redacted, so I can't tell you who it is. But he basically said, I'm just imagining federal officials standing along State Street in Bristol, which, of course, <laughs> one part of the town or city is on Tennessee. The other side of the town is on Virginia. I guess you'd better patrol that sidewalk right there if you're going to, you know, monitor interstate travel for the unvaccinated. Yeah, right there in the crosswalk, you'd have to do it. Yeah, I know that. Uh, I know that exactly that spot in Bristol. I've got uh, uh, family on my wife's side uh, near that area. So, uh, yeah, that's utterly insane. It's completely unworkable. But uh, more than that, the fact that you would think that the government could actually mandate that is insane. Forget the the backups that like the Ohio Turnpike or something as you're leaving Pennsylvania or wherever you're going. But uh, you know, just the idea that the government thinks it could do that to you is utterly insane. Encourage people, sure. But uh, restricting liberty like that, utterly insane. Jim, I, I, I do hope people actually <laughs> had a drink today. This is pretty intense. Yeah, it's a bad day, America. Hey, it's Friday. Yes. Yeah, oh. By the time you're listening to this, it's Friday afternoon. Go get that those three martinis. You're probably going to need them. <laughs> In moderation, though. I have to encourage in moderation, but at least we've got the weekend to like uh, recover here. At least we have the weekend to recover here. Jim, have a good one, and I'll see you on Monday. See you Monday, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Columbus, Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Please subscribe to the Three Martini Launch podcast. Tell your friends about us as well. We're very grateful for your five-star ratings and your kind reviews. You can get us on those home devices. All you have to say is play Three Martini Launch podcast. Follow us on Twitter. He's at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Have a great weekend, and uh, hopefully we'll see you again on Monday for the next Three Martini Lunch. Conservatives have better arguments, but the left is much better at messaging. That is a big problem. I'm Sarah Carter. On the latest Sarah Carter Show, I'll discuss how to solve this challenge with acclaimed singer and actor Robert Davi and the new film about Hunter Biden he is directing. I'll also address the latest hysteria from the United Nations on climate change and a new big tech threat to our privacy. Join me. Subscribe to the Sarah Carter Show on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.